Hi, this is Kara Tierney from Monroe Community College, and in this video we're going to talk about the quantum mechanical atomic model. This quantum mechanical model is actually what we regard to be as the current atomic model. And in order to talk about that, I think we should take a step back and remember what we learned about Bohr's atomic model. And the first important thing to know about that model was that it was only valid for single electron atoms. So that was really limiting in that it could only basically talk about hydrogen. It also gave electrons an exact path in which they moved. And this was very limiting and it also had some energy problems uh, with it that needed to be resolved in another uh, model. And it was also two dimensional and we know that atoms are three dimensional. So that also meant that it needed to be further modified for another iteration of an atomic model. And so the next atomic model that came about was uh, the quantum mechanical model. And this, like I said, is regarded to be our current atomic model. This is both a qualitative and a quantitative description of how the electrons move within an atom. So qualitative meaning showing us where they're going. Um, um, it's also quantitative in that it, it has a very specific um, set of equations that can show us how the electrons are moving. We are not going to be tackling that part of this model. Um, instead, we're going to be looking at the qualitative part. And we, in class, have talked about de Broglie's thoughts on how there is both wave and particle behavior to not just light, but everything, electrons included. And so this model incorporates that wave behavior of electrons as well. Now, uh, this model is an improvement over the Bohr's model because first and foremost, elements with multiple electrons can be described using this model. And it made it so that the uh, movement of the electrons was much more realistic and data-based. So um, this data that we base where the location of the electrons are is based off of something called electron density. So this is taking the location of electrons with a given value of energy and showing, uh, plotting it out and looking at the most probable location of where those electrons are. This electron density plot, this defined what it, we now call atomic orbitals. So atomic orbitals are locations of electrons within what we call our shells or what we were calling as the energy levels in the Boros model. Now we see these three-dimensional atomic orbitals. Within each atomic orbital, I just want to define right now, each orbital has the capacity of two electrons. And so you'll want to make a note of that. So there are different types of atomic orbitals that have different sizes, different shapes, different orientations, and we're going to be going into that in more more detail in this video. And to describe these orbitals and where electrons are within an atom, we use a set of four quantum numbers to define the location of a single electron within a given atom. So our quantum numbers, they describe an electron location somewhat like giving it an address. And with our quantum numbers, it actually goes the most broad location to your most specific location. So it's kind of the opposite of how we write our letter addresses. Instead of starting with the most specific, your street number, we're gonna start with our least specific. So it's kind of like your state. And so the least specific of our quantum numbers is N, and that's our principal quantum number and that tells us the shell or the energy level that the electrons are in. Then we get more specific and within each shell there is a subshell okay and that's defined as our L and within each subshell there is one or more orbitals and so M subscript L is specifying a specific orbital within that subshell and since each orbital has the capacity for two electrons our last quantum number which is M subscript S that defines which electron within the orbital we're talking about. And so that's called electron spin.
And our first quantum number, remember it's the most broad one, is the principal quantum number. It's sometimes referred to as the shell or the level. And I believe we're going to use the word shell, but sometimes I flip between shell and level because they're used quite equally in science uh, vernacular. So within our shell, it's similar to Bohr's energy levels in that each one, as you get farther out, has a larger radius and a higher energy. Um, it's just that this is now three-dimensional. And so the value of n, once again, reflects the relative shell radius and energy. And so we're allowed to have values just like we did in Bohr of n equals 1 and up with whole numbers only included. And if we were to look at our electrons, so let's say we have our nucleus and in our Bohr model we have these circular uh, orbits. Now we're, we're going to be looking at three-dimensional shapes. And I'm just going to show it in kind of one-dimensional. If our nucleus is here, um, as we get farther away from our nucleus, our n values are increasing. And as those n values increase, the electrons can get further away from the nucleus and they have higher energy values. Now within each shell, we have a subshell, or you could say within each level, we have a sublevel. And the, the second quantum number, L, defines which subshell we're talking about. So um, each subshell has a different characteristic shape, and so we're going to look at the different types of subshells and their shapes right now. Uh, our first subshell has the lowest energy, and that is an S subshell. S subshells have an L value of zero, and they are composed of one single atomic orbital that has a sphere shape. And this orbital, once again, was defined because we looked at a plot of all the different locations of an electron with this specific energy. Uh, we saw that it turned into kind of a sphere shape when we looked at 90% of those uh, electron locations. So the, the shape of an orbital is defined as the location where we have a, about a 90% probability of finding an electron with that energy. Now, when we compare subshells of the same type within different shells, we see that the S subshell within a first shell is going to be smaller than that in the second shell, so that would be 1S and 2S. And then in the third shell, it's going to be even bigger, but they all have that same spherical shape. And so um, when we would look at the atom, the 1S would be inside of the 2S, which would be inside of the 3S. So we're just expanding how far the electrons can move. The electrons are moving in kind of a somewhat random but with a wave motion inside of these electrons. So you can just move, think of the electrons as moving uh, very fast in a, a somewhat random motion within um, these shapes. So once again, this orbital has just a capacity of two electrons, and this is our subshell S. It has an L value of zero, and it's composed of a single sphere. The S subshells are found in all of the shells. Now, as we get into bigger shells, each one can accommodate one additional subshell. So the S subshell is the only subshell that's found in the first shell, n equals one. So our next subshell shell is not found in that first shell. It's found in the second shell and greater because these have a bigger radius. They can accommodate more subshells. So there are three orbitals in our P subshell. And those three orbitals all have a bow tie-like shape. There's one that goes along the x-axis, one along the y-axis, and one along the z-axis. And when we look at the entire P subshell together, it's all three of those combined. This is the entire P subshell. And it has three orbitals, each of which have a capacity of two electrons. So the P subshell can accommodate six electrons. Now the P subshell is only found in the second shell and greater. And it has a value of L equals one. So our next subshell is a D subshell. It has an L value equal to two. And it has five orbitals. 
which means since each can have a capacity of two electrons, it has a capacity of 10 electrons, and these orbitals start to get more complex in their shape. And so the d orbitals are only found in larger shells. And each of them kind of looks like two somewhat P-shaped orbitals, but this right here, this is just one orbital, okay? So there's five different orbitals, and the next quantum number we're going to be looking at will be defining which of those five orbitals we're talking about. So when we're talking about L equals two, that is a quantum number that's defining that our electron is in one of these five orbitals. The last subshell that we're going to talk about is an F subshell. It has an L equals three value. So when you see a set of quantum numbers, if it has an L equals three, that means it's in an F subshell. There are seven orbitals in an F subshell. Here they all are. You can see they're getting very complex. Um, they kind of go from simple to more complex shapes as we increase our L value. And once again, this is just one orbital. There are two electrons somewhere in there. So those are the different subshells that you need to know. Let's just summarize our subshells here. So we have S, P, D, and F. I will make a new column because this is important. If we were to look at the number of orbitals within each, S has one orbital, P has three, D has five, F has seven. You need to know that. And the L quantum number um, value that corresponds to each, if you have an L equals zero, that means you're looking at an S subshell. L equals one is a P subshell, L equals two is a D subshell, and L equals three is an F subshell. So before I move on to the last two quantum numbers, I just want to make sure that we're up to speed to where we need to be with these first two quantum numbers. So I want you to take a look at problem example one, and I want you to try and answer these three questions. Pause the video right now, answer the questions, and then press play when you're ready to compare your answers to mine. Okay, let's see how you did. So how many electrons can an orbital hold? That would be two. All orbitals, no matter what type, can only hold two electrons. So um, the next question B, how many 2p orbitals exist in an atom? 2p is a p subshell. All p subshells, no matter if it's 2p, 3p, 4p, they all have three orbitals. So when we look at how many electrons can be placed in a given subshell, all we need to do is we need to take the number of orbitals within that particular subshell and multiply it by two because each orbital, no matter what type, can hold two electrons. So our 3d, that would be every d has five orbitals. We're gonna multiply it by two because each of those orbitals has a capacity for two electrons, so each 3D subshell can hold 10 electrons. When we look at a 4F subshell, every F subshell has seven orbitals. Each of those orbitals can hold two electrons. That gives us a capacity of 14 electrons. And when we look at a 6P subshell, all P subshells have three orbitals. Each orbital can hold two electrons that gives us a capacity of six electrons. Let's try another question. Complete the chart of quantum numbers for an electron in each of the following atomic orbitals. Well, this will actually be an atomic subshell. I'm just going to correct myself because it's giving us atomic subshell. Um, let's do the first one together, so 3s. So the three tells us that n equals three. We're in the third shell. S tells us we are in the S subshell of the third shell. So we're looking at a subshell is within a shell. L, we look back at our, our chart that we had before. L is always equal to zero for an S. So I want you to give the other two a shot here, 4P and 5D, and press pause and press play when you are ready to compare your answers. 4 tells us that n equals 4, and p has a defined L value of 1. And in our last one, the 5 indicates n equals 5, and d always has a value of L equals 2. 
So I just want to uh, review that when we're looking at n values, these are always whole numbers that tell us the shell, and L tells us our subshell number. Okay, so let's look at n equals one. The subshells that can be in n equals one, there's only one subshell, and that's S. That has a value of zero. When we look at the second shell, S and P can both exist in our second shell. That would be values for S of zero and P of one. So that's where we get the zero to N minus one. Um, that's coming from these definitions that I have here. So for N equals three, we can have an S, P, and D all exist in the N equals three. And so those would be L values of zero, one, and two. And if we looked at our fourth shell, that can have an S, P, D, and F. And so uh, those would be values of 0, 1, 2, and 3. So I think we're ready to move on. And we're going to talk about the last two quantum numbers in the next video. So I will see you there.